Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and to welcome everybody. If you're visiting with, with us, we're very glad that you're here and hope that you can stick around, um, that we get to know each other a little bit after services tonight. Um, so tonight's lesson is entitled, Walking with God and Being Blameless. So we'll begin by singing a song of praise, um, and then we're going to ask for a plea uh, to be pure in heart and we'll encourage one another uh, to humble ourselves before the, the sermon. That let's sing 141 from the supplement. No <laughs> me. And prior to our, our prayer, uh, let's sing number 150, Pure in Heart, O God. <clears throat> no, me, pure. 
please stand as we pray. Bow with me. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne. We thank you for this time to be able to gather together, and we thank you for another beautiful spring day that you have given to us so that we can see your glory all around us, Father. We ask you at this time to help us to put away our concerns of this world, that you might help us to open our ears and open our hearts, that we can pay attention to the lesson tonight and the words that we sing, that we may be able to praise you in an acceptable manner, and that we'll be able to take something from this lesson and apply it to our lives, that we can strive to always be more pure in heart for you and live a better life every day for you. We know, Father, there are many of this congregation that are sick, that are fighting cancers, that are in the hospital. We just ask you to be with each of them and just be with them and help them to be restored to their original health. We ask you, Father, next week as we have our gospel meeting that we'll all be able to attend and that we'll be able to have many visitors come, that it will do much good in this community to spread your word. We love you so much and just be with us through the rest of this night. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Before tonight's sermon, let's sing 107, Humble Yourself. to have everyone here tonight. If you open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, we'll start there here in a few minutes as we study and reason together. There are certain things about how God has revealed different ideas to us in his word that I personally that I find very intriguing. There are some things that are mentioned many times, obviously concepts that we want to take in and that uh, that are usually a major part of our faith and how we live before him. There are some things that are mentioned just once, um, which kind of grabs our attention as to, to why it's there just the one time, but understanding that the word of the, word of the Lord is sovereign, and if God said it once, that's, that is enough. But there's, some, there's another thing that I find that intrigues me as I look into the word of God in different places, and, and that's when we find something that's mentioned Maybe just a couple of times, maybe two or three times someplace, because that kind of draws my attention to, well, why, why did that happen? Why is it said just these one or two times? What about that is something that I want to learn from? One example of that might be when you go to the New Testament, the Gospels especially, there are two or three times where it mentions that Jesus marveled about something. And that kind of gets my attention, because I, I think to myself, well, 
This didn't happen a lot. This is the, the very Son of God here on earth, and it says that this caused him to marvel, and I want to know more about that. And so as, as you go with me down this train of thought, tonight we want to think about another one of those instances that, that I see. There, there are just a couple of people in the Bible that are described as blameless, that as they are, as it is talked about their walk before God and, and who they are, the term is used that they are one who God calls blameless. Now, the term blameless is used several times in, in the Bible, as we'll look at tonight, but, but as it's assigned to specific people, just, just a couple of times we see that. And so as I, as I studied that and as I began to, to look into that, I noticed that along with the, the idea of someone being called blameless, there's tied together this idea of them walking with God. And walking with God is talked about many times in in the Bible, but it was interesting to me how the, the two went hand in hand in different areas. And, and as I look at that even further, we see that God himself puts those two things together. When you look in Genesis, the, um, Genesis, the, the 17th chapter and, and verse 1, it says there as God is, is talking to Abraham, or Abram at this point, it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, Walk before me and be blameless. So we see God tying these two ideas together. And so I want to think about that. I want to reason about that with you some tonight. And if you look at the bulletin, I did things a little differently this time. You'll see the names of five different men there that we want to think about. That, that some of them, it specifically talks about blameless. A couple of them, there's something else special about just them and and thinking about what it is that we want to see from the lives of these men that can apply to us as we think about walking with God and being blameless. And so I, I've put those there. I've put most of the verses that we'll talk about, but I've just left space for you to maybe put some notes about what stands out to you about some of these men. What resonates with you about them and their lives? And as we go through some points that aren't on the outline We'll mention probably each of these men at some point as we go down through there. But one thing to start off with that, that I want to think about with you is we look at the names of some of the men that we have on the bulletin and, and others that we'll think about from time to time this evening. And we have a tendency sometimes to, to kind of elevate these gentlemen and, and to look at them as something, maybe they had something that we can't have or that they had some different ability and that's really not the case from what i see certainly some of them experienced extraordinary things that god did with them or worked through them or gifts that he gave them but they weren't created any differently than you and i and god was able to use them in the capacity that he did or give them some gift or or use them to direct his people because they were willing to walk with him and that's one of the things that I want to see tonight. In at least two different passages in the Old Testament, we find that certain men had a special connection or influence with God. And it's mentioned that way. In Jeremiah 15, in verse 1, God tells, us, tells the prophet there that even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before him, his heart would not be with his people because so great was their sin. And there's the implication there that these two men normally had a special connection with God, but in this case it would not prevail because of the greatness of the sin. But also if you look in Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 14, here we see three of the men that are on the bulletin that we might consider tonight. And this is where God tells Ezekiel that even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver their own lives but their, by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. And when you think about the context of what's happening there, we don't have time to, to tell the whole story, but, but basically five or six years before final destruction, the Israelite elders living in Babylon came to Ezekiel to inquire whether the Lord would spare their homeland. And he reveals, the Lord reveals to Ezekiel that these men who were outwardly pious, but inwardly had set up idols in their hearts, he says in verse 3 of Ezekiel 14, um, that because, because, of their, because of their idolatry, that Ezekiel gave them this word from the Lord that Israel's too, sin was too great for deliverance. And that even if these three godly men that he mentions here, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were to pray that they would not be delivered. Well, why did God pick them out? That's what's interesting to me to see. Noah delivered his own family from God's judgment. 
Daniel delivered his three friends. Job lost even his children in his trial and yet remained faithful to God. But God mentions these men four different times in this situation in Ezekiel because of their faithfulness, because they walked with God, because two of them specifically, he says, were blameless. And I want to know more about that. What does that mean? How do I get there? What does that look like? That's what we want to think about tonight. So when we think about the righteousness of these men that, it's talk, that he talks about here, it stems from faith. That's where we'll start. It's a very simple concept, but very simply we want to look at what God tells us about each one of these men and, and how from their faith we see the idea of that they are blameless and that they, and that they walk with God. So when you consider that, that walking with God in faith is one of the first things that we see all, with all of them, think first about Noah. When you look in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9 and we talk about Noah, notice what it says about him here as we're introduced to him in this way. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. There's those two things tied together. Noah is one of the two men that I can find in the Word of God that were specifically called blameless. And so, as I think about that, and it says that Noah was a righteous man, he was blameless in his time, it's referring to his conduct. It's referring to the things that he did on a regular, daily basis, that he was called righteous, and that he was called blameless. And we'll get to the idea of what blameless really means here in just a few minutes. But just think about this concept, first of all, about the, that we need to be able to be walking with God in faith to, obtain, to attain the kind of recognition that we see God give these different men here. You go back a couple of verses and notice what it says about Noah. When God is talking about what has happened on the earth and his displeasure with what man has become, in the book of Genesis, in verse 7, it says, The Lord said, I will blot out man who I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping thing and birds of the heavens. And then notice this, because this is very telling about Noah when you think about it in context here. It's God says, for I am sorry that I have made them. Talking about mankind. But then there's verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Lots of different people have done many different calculations. How many people were on the earth at this particular time when God decided to destroy it by flood? I can't give you an exact answer. I have my ideas. Other people have their ideas. But there were a lot. And of all the people that God was sorry that he had made, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Well, you go back there to verse 9, and what does it say? That he was blameless in his generation, that he walked with God. That ought to get our attention. We want to know what it is that God is telling us there so that we can find the same types of things in our lives. And so when we think about that, walking with God means faith means faith in God, is one of the things that it means. And we're not just talking about saving faith here, but we're talking about a life of constant trust in God. That's one of the things that Noah had. Faith means believing God concerning the unseen things, even when things may seem to contradict what God has said. When you look here at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, what does it say about Noah's faith? It says, by faith, Noah being warned... By God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Walking with God means faith in God. God warned Noah the coming judgment of the flood. He told him about something that would happen that he had never seen before. He told him that that was going to destroy the earth. And Noah had to take God's word by faith and act on it in opposition to what he saw with his eyes. Now let's make a practical application there to us today. God tells us different things about how we ought to live, how we ought to keep ourselves separate from the world, for instance, how we ought to make a covenant with our eyes not to look at certain things or take certain things into our mind, how we ought to put him first above everything else, and if we do that, we will have everything that we need. But how often, how often 
do we take just those concepts I've mentioned and decide on our own not to trust God? Because we don't really believe that. Maybe we don't trust that if I put him first and put aside these other things that I'm depending upon myself, that I'll be taken care of. Maybe we don't trust him that it's okay if I watch this or I look at this or I'm a part of this. It's really not going to affect my spirituality this much. I've heard, I've heard some say, well, as long as I recognize this is a bad thing and that I shouldn't be a part of this, then while I'm doing it, it's going to be okay. We need to trust what God has said if we want to walk with him, if we want to be those who are blameless, just like Noah did. Noah had to take God's word by faith and act on it in opposition to what he saw in his eyes. And he built his whole life around this word of God, apart from any tangible evidence that it would happen. He had never seen a flood before. He had never seen the earth destroyed, but yet he believed that God would do that. You think about Daniel. Daniel demonstrated that same practical faith to God throughout his long life. When Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill Daniel and his friends because no one would interpret the untold dream, Daniel depended upon God and he waited on him. He had faith in him that God would provide, that God would help. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 17 here, it talks about that Daniel went to his house and made the matter that was of the king saying he was going to destroy everyone because they could not interpret his dream. He made it known to his companions in verse 18. He said he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Notice verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision that night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He walked with God in faith. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know if in the morning he was going to be gathered up with the rest of the wise men and be killed, but he had faith in God, and he trusted in him. And because of that, he walked with him. It's not talked about that Daniel was specifically used the word blameless with Daniel, but think of the extraordinary visions and the extraordinary relationship that Daniel had with God that no one else had. That's why he's in this list. So we think about him walking with God in that way. Later, when he was thrown into the lion's den because he would not stop praying, he trusted in God to protect him there. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 15, when, when the men came from the, from the king and said, Daniel has violated your law. In verse 16, the king commanded Daniel, was brought and cast into the den of lions and declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. We know that he did because Daniel had that faith. He walked with God. The same is true of Job. When Job, when his children had been killed, his riches were gone, his body was racked with pain, his friends accused him of secret sin. Job affirmed something. Job chapter 19 and verse 25. What did Job say in the midst of all of this crisis? We, we, we've, we've talked about this before, and I probably have said it before, but just try to imagine, try to put yourself where Job is when this happens. I can't imagine losing what he lost all at once. And all of us sometimes like to think that we're strong and that we would, our faith would see us through, but it would be hard. It would be hard to lose what he lost and know that he hasn't done something to cause it to happen and be where he is. But what does he say in, verse 9, in chapter 19? He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. That's why Job is one of the men described as blameless. Because of his faith in that way. How about Enoch? There's not a lot said about Enoch. But we can trust from what is said and what we see elsewhere in the scriptures that he walked with God in faith. It tells us in Genesis chapter 5, as it talks about who he was, that he lived 65 years, that he fathered Methuselah. In verse 22, it says Enoch walked with God after he fathered with Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And then we see these verses, verse 23 and verse 24. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Here's one of those interesting things again. There are two people that I can find in the Bible that did not see death because God took them, and Enoch is one of them. Why? We want to know more about that and understand what, why that happened with Enoch. Or, or think about Elijah. <clears throat> think about walking with God in faith. Why? Elijah is the other one who didn't see death. 
who stands out to us as we, as we think about that. You know, Elijah, if you read 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, we're not going to do that tonight, but you think about how he had to stand before the most powerful king of that time, condemn his sin, be the one who was on his own, and say, God is going to do this. It's not going to rain for three years. That's a pretty bold statement to make. And the only way that Elijah knew that was going to happen was that he had prayed to God about that. That's faith. And that's walking in faith. Could you do that? I understand there's a circumstance there and that Elijah is a prophet of God, but could you have the kind of faith that Elijah did? To be able to make a bold statement and live by it knowing that God is faithful and that he will deliver. We're told in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10 to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing in every good work and in bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. These men that we have seen tonight that we've talked about thus far are men who were doing just that. I talked about Elijah and him praying to God and him having faith. Notice what's recorded of him a couple thousand years later, that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and bore its fruit. That's because he was one who was walking with God. And that's what our Christian life is about, counting upon God's word concerning the future of heaven and the judgment of hell. We don't want to get away from this. We don't want to get away from this idea of living, striving to live blamelessly and walking with God in faith, understanding what it means and, and appreciating that as we see these men who have done this in times gone past, we see the special relationship they have with God. We see the closeness and the intimacy that they had with God. We see the things God was able to accomplish through them because of that relationship. We can be people like them. That doesn't mean we're, going to, we're not going to be a prophet of God, like Elijah was. And I have serious doubts that, anyone, that, that God is going to take us up as he did Enoch or Elijah today in this age. But it doesn't mean that we can't be someone who God can use like he used them. So as we think about that, walking with God and being blameless has to do with obedience, obviously. So what do we mean by this word blameless? We've talked about it a couple of times, but let's think for just a moment about what it means. Sometimes we have a misconception about what it means. Blameless does not mean without, completely without sin. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There was one man who was perfect, and that was Jesus Christ, who was here upon this earth. So I have to assume then, and I have to know from what I read in, in God's word, that there were times when Job sinned or Noah sinned. And I can find some instances of those things. But they were still called blameless. Why? Well, when we think about this word blameless, as it's used of Noah there in Genesis chapter 6, the, the root meaning of that word means whole. It means integrated. It means one who is upright. One who is striving for completeness and perfection. And so as I start to look at it that way, understanding why Noah was called blameless and why Job was called blameless, the picture starts to become a little more clear. Noah obeyed God and built the ark in the face of intense ridicule and doubt. He obeyed by getting on board the ark before there was any evidence of a flood. Twice we are told that Noah did according to everything that the Lord commanded him. That's why in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, he is called blameless in his generation. There is no one else that God saw that was willing to do those things that Noah did. He obeyed God and was called blameless. He was trying to live upright. And when you think about this word and you start looking at the entomology of it, the idea of blameless and being upright and striving for completeness, think about being upright. If you get knocked over, what do you want to do? You want to get upright, don't you? If you're inverted, if you're upside down, you're disoriented, you don't know exactly what direction you're going, you're striving to be upright. Where you can have your bearings, where you can go the right way, where you can do the right things, where the things that you're doing are effective. And that's the idea behind the word of being blameless 
not only just being upright, but striving in that direction. And that's what we see from these different men. That's why it says in Genesis 26, 22, and 7, 5 that Noah did all that God commanded him. It doesn't mean that Noah never sinned, but Noah's was striving to go the right direction. It doesn't tell us that Daniel himself was blameless, but look what is said about Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5. As it talks about those who were trying to make accusations against him in verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and the satraps sought to make a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. And no error or fault was found in him. These men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. In other words, they had to make something up because Daniel was living blamelessly. Job submitted to God even though he didn't understand what was happening. When you think about Job in Job chapter 1 and verse 1, here's where it talks about him as a blameless man. Interestingly enough, when you look in, into the scriptures, it's mentioned three different times about Job that he was this way. Here is it describes him in the very first book, in the very first chapter, in the very first verse. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright. There's those two words together. One who feared God and turned away from evil. In verse 8, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. The same thing is said in chapter 2 and verse 3 as Satan comes back to God and talks about Job. But notice at the end of that verse that he still holds fast his integrity, talking about the kind of man that Job was. Each of these men Job and Daniel and, and Noah obeyed God over the long haul of things. It wasn't just an instance that we're talking about. It wasn't just a particular situation. Over the course of their lives, we see them walking in obedience and being blameless. It took Noah 100, 120 years to build the ark. And think of what people were saying about him while he was doing that. Maybe a favorite pastime to watch this older man working on the ark, there it was, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, sitting high and dry in Noah's backyard, you might say. Imagine what people might have thought and what they were saying about Noah, but Noah continued on. Daniel and Job obeyed God over the long haul in spite of opposition and adversity. Daniel was in his 80s, most likely, when he was thrown into the lion's den. Some might have thought, what a reward for a faithful life that he is now thrown into the lion's den after all that he's done and stood for for God. But Daniel submitted to God's sovereign control over that situation and was victorious. Job didn't understand why he was being treated the way that he was. And he questioned that and he admitted his intense frustration. But he never defied God or said or called out that, that he should not be treated that way. Enoch was obviously blameless as well. Why else would God take him? We see there in Genesis 5 and verse 24. And he was putting forth this idea that James talks about of trying to be complete, walking with God. James says in, in James chapter 1 and verse 4, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be complete and perfect, lacking nothing. That's the idea of living blamelessly. Elijah obviously was walking in obedience with God for this to happen. In 2 Kings chapter 2, when you think about the end of his life, as Elijah and Elisha are walking together and going on, it says, Behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. That didn't happen to other people. It happened because Elijah was someone who obediently and blamelessly walked with God. And so as we think about that, sometimes it's easy to obey God as long as life is going well, or as long as things don't get difficult, if things don't get in our way. But if we have to go through extended trials, that's when sometimes we begin to peel away. Look at these men. Look at the things that they endured for their entire lives. 
Look, look at how they walked in obedience. And, and because of that, they're known, some of them, as blameless. That's what we want to see from some of these things. Remember that Elijah, as he dealt with these things, he dealt with trials, he dealt with these difficulties, and Jezebel wanted to come after him after he had destroyed the prophets and told him in verse 3 here of 1 Kings chapter 19, or verse 2 rather, that she was going to do to him what he did to the prophets. And it says that he ran in fear, ran in fear for his life. But, but we, we know, know that he was still obedient. We know that he could be called someone who was blameless because of what we see happen to him later in that chapter. In 1 Kings 19 and verse 14, he talks about that I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Why would that be happening to him if he wasn't the one who was being obedient, who was striving to live blamelessly? You go on in those verses that follow, and you see the things that God says he's going to do. Why? Because Elisha was an obedient, blamelessly living servant of his. And he tells him what his plan is. He tells him what's going to happen and how that God himself will reign. And so thinking about all those things together and understanding that just as God told Elijah, there were still others who were walking with him as well, we also need to understand that walking with God means integrity with God. Both Noah and Job specifically were said to be blameless, to be complete or to whole, to be complete or whole. And really, that carries with it the idea of having integrity. And so, although the word is not used specifically of Daniel, we see that quality of him where no accusation could be made against him. And so when you think about this idea of integrity and think of, of, of what it means to have integrity with God, these men that were blameless, it doesn't mean that they were sinlessly perfect, but it means that they weren't hypocritical. It means that they didn't put on a good front and then live a different way. It means that they strove to uphold the Word of God. And as we think about that for ourselves today, how do we get that kind of integrity? How do we walk with God in that way? Well, in a word, it's being honest with God and being honest with others. To walk openly before God on the right level, not hiding sin or thinking that he doesn't see some part of our life. When you think about these men that we have talked about thus far, that's how they walk. They walk before God with integrity. They, and God saw the things that were in their heart, and they lived the way that they said that they were living. When we think about the Word of God and how it does that for us today, and that we want to live with integrity as well. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Verse 13 that goes along with that says, No creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You think about those men and how they walked with God and why they were considered blameless. Understand that God sees every part of our life just as he saw theirs. God was able to use them because he could see what was in Noah's heart. He could see what Noah would follow through with and the challenges that he would face and that he would be able to to sustain, sustain himself through those things. things. The, the same, same with Elijah, the same with Job, the same, same with Enoch. And as, as we, we think about that, remember that we too will face God in judgment and that we too want to use the right words and be true to the things that we're doing and the things that we're saying. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, for pretext or for greed, God is witness. And in verse 10 he says, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was, was our conduct towards you, the believers. Paul's putting forth the idea here of being blameless, of living with integrity in everything that we do. That's what we see those men do. That's what God asks of us as well. Enoch, obviously, was someone who lived that way, even though we know little about him. But we think about how he walked, and, and consider Ephesians chapter 5 here in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but, but is wise. Enoch, Enoch had to live, live that way in order to, to be one that God was willing to take. Or Elijah and, and the things that he faced and how he had to, to stand and stand before all of those who were opposing him. 
It makes, it makes me, me think of Philippians chapter, chapter 2 and what Paul says here. He, he tells, tells us, therefore, my beloved, as you, not, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, notice what, what he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and questioning. And notice what he says here to finish this thought. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, there's, There's the, the idea, idea of integrity. In, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, generation among whom you shine as lights, lights of the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that, that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. All these things remind us of what, what these men went through. That, that sometimes they had to stand alone. And, and sometimes that can happen with us as well. Being blameless and standing alone sometimes go hand in hand. All three of these men lived in especially ungodly times. In Noah's day, ungodliness was so rampant that as we read earlier that God said he was sorry that he had made man and decided to judge the entire earth by flood. In Job's day, we don't read of any unified people of God. In Daniel's day, we read of him and his three friends that were faithful to God. And that's all that we read about at that time. These were strong pressures on these men probably to compromise. We think about Daniel and what he was asked to do. To stand alone for God before the lion's den. But you notice the conviction of these men that each time they faced one of these things, they were willing to do that. Today, you and I don't face that same difficulty as much. We come together at times like this and, and come amongst many who are willing to build us up and to help us in our faith. But those men stood alone. Think about what, what Daniel did when he, had, when he knew the document had been signed, that he could not pray to his God anymore. What did he do? Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, When he knew the document had been signed, he went to the house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had previously done. It didn't faze him. He didn't, he didn't change. change. He, he stood alone, and that's, that's why we look, look at him as blameless. Elijah certainly felt alone, as we've noted. There there in verse 14 that we read just a few moments ago, he says, I alone, or I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. More than once, Elijah felt alone. You go to Second Kings, the first chapter, where Elijah had to stand before King Ahaziah several times as, as he sent men and captains of 50 against him to bring him in, basically. And each time, Elijah stood for God and, and did God's will. Fire rained down and destroyed those men because Elijah continued to stand for him. Walking with God sometimes means that you will face situations where you must stand alone against the crowd. But, but we, we realize that we are never alone if we are living and walking blamelessly because, that, because God stands with us. So, so you take, take all of these things that we've talked about tonight and, and put them into very simple terms for us. How do we walk with God and be blameless today? You have to remember what it means to walk with him, to be in association with him like that, not, Not just in easy times, times, but in the difficult times as well. Remember what it means to be blameless and appreciate the scriptures that point us in that direction. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. We haven't even talked about those in the New Testament. But think about Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, who suffered much because of his faith. He says, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That's, That's a very, very sober, sober charge when you think about it. That, that it comes from a man who lost his life for the cause of Christ. And, and he's telling you, walk in a worthy manner. The calling with, with which you have been called. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, he says, we exhorted that each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. And there's a different spin on what he's saying here. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. When you, when you think, think back about the men that we have talked about tonight in, in and all of these different ways, why did they do those things? They, they did it because of their faith, because of their obedience. We've talked, we've talked about, about their standing alone and, and their integrity. But, but ultimately, they, they knew the God that they served. And they, they wanted to do those things 
because, because of his kingdom and because of his glory in the, the time in which they existed. existed. And, that's and that's something for us to think about today. today. What, how, how do we walk in, order, in, in a way that then glorifies God in the kingdom today and draws others to him? I'll leave, I'll leave you with this tonight as we consider these things. things. Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 3 and 4. As, as Paul begins this book, this, this letter, letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians these, these are some, are some of the first things that he says to them. He says, says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. When you read that, and you appreciate what it is that God is asking of us, He's asking, asking of us the same thing that he asked of Noah and, and Job and, and Daniel, Enoch, Enoch Elijah, and, and a number of others that we might mention. Just, Just as he, he said to, to Abram in Genesis 17, 17 and verse 1, walk before me and, and be blameless. God asks, God asks the same thing of us today, today to, be to be set, set apart, to be, to be different, to be, to be upright, upright, to be, to be committed, to walk, walk with integrity. integrity. And when, and when we, we do those things, we recognize, recognize the home that awaits those who are, who are willing to give, give themselves to God in that way. You see the reward that came to some of the men that we mentioned tonight. And we, and we think of the even greater reward that awaits us. It's not just a matter of being taken from this earth and, and missing death as a couple of them did, but it's the reward of an eternity forever with a God who created all things, who can do all things, and puts aside every sin and, and puts aside all the things that pull us, us away, away from joy, joy and happiness in this life. life. Tonight, Tonight, as you, you think about your standing before God, are you walking in a way that, that is pleasing to him? him? Can, Can we help you change that? that? If you've thought, thought about that, that, if you know that you need to change things in your life, whether, whether that, that means that you need, need prayers of encouragement, that you need to repent of sin, or whether that means that you need to be baptized into Christ for the very first time and start that walk with him, would you please let us know how we can help you with that by coming to the front? as we stand and as we sing this song.